case, uh, 86 year old female with history of uh, non small cell lung cancer presented with elevated liver enzymes. This is the axial T2. Arterial phase. And this is the portovenous. So any thoughts on how will we read this scan and what are the findings? Or did I unshare it? Yeah, you yeah. need to reshare. Gitanjali, to me, this looks like a METS versus abscess case. Yeah, like if you have these multiple lesions, you always worry about in a patient who has primary cancer that be that these small lesions are METS versus abscess. They were showing restricted diffusion and that's exactly how we read it out. But I think the other, so they, they biopsied it and biopsy showed no malignancy, no infection. Uh, and so we came back and look at this case and we realized that there's a lot of biliary dilation in this. And this is the MRCP. Now I'm thinking PSC. Yeah, so it looks like PSC, but PSC in an 86 year old female, I mean, it's really um, uncommon that we don't see PSC in such old patients. They're usually seen in younger patients. And I don't know if patients with PSC live that long enough because they have so many comorbidities. And they called on PATH, they called this as sclerosing cholangitis. Um, and then we realized obviously she was, she had history of lung cancer. So we checked her medication and she was on this immunotherapy pembrolizumab. I hope I'm saying that correct. Um, and then we realized there are several case reports on uh, immunotherapy induced sclerosing cholangitis, which on imaging sclerosing cholangitis would look the same. And this is called secondary sclerosing cholangitis because it's the effect of chemotherapy. Just sharing some um, screenshots showing the case reports. Y'all can see this. So this is World Journal of Gastroenterology um, showed us um, or wrote a systemic uh, review on. And these are uh, PDL1 inhibitors. So PDL1 inhibitors causing sclerosing cholangitis. More case reports. Um, so there are so many of these. So we were really surprised. And I think with these newer immunotherapies, we have this learning curve. We are uh, getting to know more and more immunotherapy related complications. I earlier showed a case of nivolumab induced pancreatitis, and this is another one. In fact, the most common complication is uh, sclerosing cholangitis from these, or hepatotoxicity from uh, these immunotherapy agents. And they also grade it. So that is why I had pulled up this uh, up to date article. Um, they grade this hepatotoxicity as grade one, grade two, grade three. In this case, it was grade two, and it depends on how bad the LFTs are. So I think that was a good case where we, when we see sclerosing cholangitis in an elderly patient with history of primary cancer, I think we should think of immunotherapy induced complications. Actually, that's super interesting because last time we also talked about how your prior nivolumab, nivolumab induced pancreatitis looked like autoimmune pancreatitis. Autoimmune, yeah. They, they were, uh, when they described it in the case reports, they said that they, it looks like autoimmune pancreatitis and um, all these are treated with steroids. So the management is also the same. I think they're just not uh, associated with IgG elevation all the time. Very cool. So this is a 76 year old male who came in with history of recurrent proximal small bowel ulcerations. And they ordered the CTA to look for bowel ischemia because he had multiple episodes of upper GI bleed. More of an eye test. And you're focusing more on stomach and proximal small bowel. I mean, that's the diodinum. And I'll stop at the image where the finding is. And it's a small finding, hard to pick up. We didn't call much on the CTA. Then they got um, ordered an MR because clinically their worry was uh, 
a neuroendocrine tumor, a gastrinoma, because this patient had his classic history of recurrent proximal small bowel ulcerations with elevated gastrin levels. But again, even on MR, we didn't see much. So they finally did a dotted tape scan. And this is where the area of uptake was. So we went back and looked at the CTA. Oops. And right at the area where there was increased uptake on the pet, there was this small enhancing nodule along the, it was abutting the wall of the duodenum. It was not like really along in the wall of the duodenum, abutting the wall of the duodenum. So we called it as a classic gastronoma in the gastronoma triangle. So the teaching point here was like all neuroendocrine tumors, functioning neuroendocrine tumors are not always within the pancreas. And we know that gastronoma is most commonly happen in the gastronoma triangle, uh, which is, um, is at the insert, um, junction of the insertion of the cystic duct to the CBD. The other point is the head, um, the neck body junction of the pancreas and the D2, D3 junction. So this was a nice case of small gastronoma in the gastronoma triangle. I think that's all I have. Very nice. So Gitanjali, that one you think is, um, was outside the duodenum, like in a lymph node next to it or something? Yeah, it seemed like they're, they're treating this conservatively they're just with PPIs, uh, but just on imaging, it didn't look like in the wall. It looked more in the mesentery abutting the wall of the duodenum. Cool. Because I know for other neuroendocrine tumors, when we see a lymph node outside of the duodenum, we have to go look in the duodenum for the primary tumor as well. Yeah. But I wasn't sure if gastronomas can just be outside the duodenum. I don't know. Okay, so this was um, an older gentleman who came in for thrombocytopenia. And on clinical exam, they thought his spleen was enlarged, which is why they did like an abdomen only scan. So that's why I don't have the full pelvis images. So this was evaluate for splenomegaly. Just gonna scroll through the interesting findings. Any thoughts so far? I would say lymphoma or melanoma. Right, uh, Kuki nailed it. Um, so spleen was big and we have these bilateral, slightly heterogeneous adrenal masses. We see some non-enhancing areas within both of them. And then the thing we didn't pick up on was the small bowel involvement. So fold thickening and mass like wall thickening along the small bowel. So this was just a complementary case to what Victoria showed last week. So of course we did a PET CT where the adrenals lit up and this is where all those bowel loops also lit up. Wow. And then when we came back, we saw that yes, there is plaque like thickening along the small bowel loops. So just a nice case of differentials for bilateral adrenal masses. We saw this last week, melanoma met surely can do those. Um, if they didn't have these other bowel and splenomegaly findings, just primary bilateral adrenal masses would be FIOs, METs, of course, in a patient who has a known primary, and then a bunch of infections which can present with bilateral adrenal enlargement as well. So just gonna stop this screen share and show another case. What was the... Yes, so histologically, they're all um, diffuse large B cell lymphomas. They're actually aggressive. They don't do all that great is what I was reading. And they're uh, frequently bilateral in elderly male patients. So if you have um, lymphoma, you can have adrenal involvement as part of lymphoma in general, but primary adrenal lymphoma itself is a more rare condition. That's the one we see in older male patients. And these are the ones that can have um, elevated serum LDH levels. They can have adrenal insufficiency as the only presenting finding. So they'll come in with fatigue, weight loss, and symptom, non-specific symptoms. And when, when they do biochemical testing, it comes back adrenal insufficiency, 
but then the reason can often be because there is lymphomatous involvement of the adrenal glands. So let me find this case. So this was another interesting case. And he was a construction worker. Um, and over the last three months, he had unexplained 30 to 40 pound weight loss, extreme fatigue. He could no longer continue working. He would just come home and just crash. And he was found to be hypotensive. And they did a full lab workup. And labs ended up actually showing adrenal insufficiency as well. So this was the imaging. So we have T2s here. We have pre-fat set T1s. We don't have post-contrast. This is the in and out of phase. So any thoughts so far? Biochemically, he is completely insufficient. Can you so show the out of phase out again? So his PO workup was normal, not any functioning adenoma because cortisol and all that was normal. He was very I mean, um, adrenal insufficient. There's hemorrhage or heme in it, very T2 black, and there's high signal on the... Right, right. Some patchy areas. But I think I know this case. I mean... It's okay, a... we'll wait for the others then. Yeah. I mean, spontaneous adrenal hemorrhage. Bilateral. Sure, possible. It's odd. We've seen that in sick patients, pregnant women, etc. Did, um, did you have a diffusion? I do have a diffusion. Let me, and it restricted. So here's the high B value, and here's the ABC. So we were not sure either. So those were kind of the differentials we had given was, could this be hemorrhage or some weird non-functioning tumor of some sort, which didn't produce any hormones. Um, infection was one other thing because in endemic countries, TB often causes um, hypoadrenalism and in the early stages can actually present as enlarged adrenals rather than um, hypoplastic small adrenals with calcifications which come on later in this stage. So I mean, infection or something infiltrative, weird things like lymphoma, sarcoid, which have involved the gland are some of the other differentials. So um, endocrine did a thorough workup on him. They couldn't find anything. So patient actually got handed over to ID and they worked him up for all sorts of infection, HIV, TB being the common infections which can cause caseating granulomas in the adrenals and hence destroy the gland and cause necrosis and hypoadrenalism. So it turned out that- It's of histo that did this, I think. Rose. So it's actually blasto. Histo is a great thought. So this one was actually blasto. So the urine blasto levels were um, abnormal. So they attributed it to blasto. They were thinking about doing a biopsy, but the titers were significant enough that they presumptively treated him with um, itraconazole. And this is his CT five years later. This is an older case. The MR is older. The CT is now. So five years later, his adrenals still look very enlarged, now more centrally lower density than the periphery. So, so very interesting case of very massively enlarged adrenals, and that turned out to be due to infection. With the TB ones, we often see that the gland atrophies and then you get calcifications and whatnot. So just a quick um, review of adrenals. I just have this small PowerPoint. Let me see if it, I can Rupa, while you're pulling that up, screen. I don't know if you have yeah. cover blasto in there, but I was just Googling it because I just to remind myself. Yes. And it seems like it's more common in Ohio, Mississippi yes. River Valley, Great Lakes. There you go. Do you see my screen? Yeah. But are you guys on the Mississippi River Valley? Is that why you saw it? No, we're not. We're slightly lower, 
but they generally work them up for all these things. Um, this, let me do this. It's a lung infection, but it can involve skin, bone, adrenals. And like we saw, it can cause these granulomas, which can destroy the gland. Uh, this was just a nice picture they had of a literature case where they sh showed primary blasto of the adrenals. And the later stages of my case reminded me of how the adrenals look like in this case as well. That necrosis which sets in causing the lower density. And this was a nice case of primary adrenal lymphoma, which we see the these homogeneously enlarged masses. And then after treatment, they shrunk away and became flat and normal. So those were my adrenal cases. And I will do a better job with screen share next time. So thank you. Um, I have a question. For when we said histo cookie, do we meant like histocytosis or is is, is it another histo? Histoplasmosis. Histoplasmosis. Oh, okay. In St. Louis, we had a, a case very uh, similar, so I should have thought of that. But yeah, um, bilateral adrenal gland involvement with histo. And tell me again, what part of the country gets histo? That's Ohio, Mississippi Valley. Is that's histoplasmosis? Okay. Um, we see a lot of histo here, aren't they, in Arkansas? We do see a lot of histo. We're a little below the Mississippi Valley, but we have plenty yeah, of histo. Yeah, that's the classic, though. Ohio, Mississippi Valley is. Yeah, awesome. yeah. Okay. We like the worst ones we see are the, like the fibrosing mediastinitis ones from histo. Those are probably one of the worst ones we see, and the uh, pituitary things also. Cool. I have an adrenal case. I can follow up. Um, I can. So um, here is my patient who has this adrenal mass. I'll show you on some other sequences. You can see it's kind of T2 intermediate with uh, another area that's T2 bright. Here it is on the pre-contrast. Arterial phase. You can see that T2 bright area is kind of avidly enhancing. It's like a collision tumor. Good, great thought. Um, this is the delayed phase where it's still fairly avidly enhancing. And then I'll try to show you the in and outs. Um, so like this is the out of phase and this is the in phase. Combination so, of adeno and pheochromocytoma it looks like. Okay, exactly. That's exactly what we were thinking. Um, so this part, this larger part here looked like it had a lot of intravoxel fat or, in, or microscopic fat. So we thought this looked like a large adenoma. And then this part here was T2 bright and had avid enhancement. So we said this was a pheochromocytoma. So we, um, we said, we think this is a collision tumor with a pheochromocytoma on an adenoma. And my urologist said, I've never heard of a collision tumor. And then I showed him, stuff in the radiology literature. And he's like, well, we don't talk about this in the endocrinology or the urology literature. So he basically told me, I was like making it up. There's no such thing as a collision tumor. But anyway, he kept asking me, do I think this is an adrenal cortical carcinoma? So do you guys think that this is possibly an adrenal cortical carcinoma? Not seen this much fat in those and it's large enough. Four centimeters is where we kind of worry, right? Right, exactly. So we said, we still think this is a collision tumor. And um, the difference is that if we think it's gonna be an adrenal cortical carcinoma at all, they would do open surgery rather than laparoscopic surgery because you don't wanna seed anything along the way. And so, um, and then interestingly, this patient was producing, was like, was on seven antihypertensive medications, had a mild elevation of their metanephrines and also had an elevation in their cortisol levels. Does this change anything? I mean, then definitely not feel like be feel, right? Yeah, cancers can produce hormones 50% of the patients. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we still don't know. So the cortisol could still be being produced by either an adenoma or an adrenal cortical carcinoma. And the mild elevation of metanephrines could be produced by a pheo. But also there can be a lot of false positives because it's not as specific. It's very sensitive, but not very specific. So anyway, this was resected and this turned out to be um, an adrenal cortical neoplasm of uncertain malignant potential. So I want to, oops, 
Now it's I'm like the say. stump party. Every organ has a stump, no? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so this was actually the pathology slides. Um, this was the gross path from this uh, tumor. And so you can see that there were, there were two parts of it. So there was the smooth part. That was the part that had the um, microscopic fat. And then this part over here, our pathologist said that was the, the part that was T2 bright with a lot of enhancement. And actually that had a lot of necrosis with a high mitotic index, which is why this became an adrenal cortical neoplasm of uncertain malignant potential. So what I learned was that you can have adrenal adenomas that can have microscopic fat. And this is because of the hormones that have a lipid content. You can have adrenal cortical carcinomas. These can also have microscopic fat that can make lipid hormones. So both of them can make cortisol, for example. And then in between, you have something called an adrenal cortical neoplasm of uncertain malignant potential. And so what I learned is that if you have an adenoma that has an atypical region like ours did, um, it, could be, it could be a collision tumor like we raised, or it could be a very atypical adenoma. And if it, is, if it does have these features, you might wanna raise this possibility. Um, this would mean the surgeon does open surgery rather than laparoscopic surgery, and also that the pathologist will look more carefully for areas of necrosis and mitotic index. Um, so for adrenal cortical carcinoma, they use something called the Weiss index, and it's like this whole scaling system. And they'll use that if they see any necrosis or mitotic index, um, and that will help them tell if it's an ACC or one of these malign unknown malignant potential. And just to address the, uh, the FEO issue again, so um, this is an adrenal gland. And so the medulla, which is in the middle, um, is the one that produces epinephrine and norepinephrine that you, know, you can get a pheochromocytoma from the adrenal medulla. And the cortex is what produces glucocorticoids, which are cortisol and aldosterone. And these are steroids, but they're also considered lipids. And this is the reason that we see this intracellular, or in, um, intracellular lipid or microscopic lipid on, on MR. So um, pheos are not lipids, and so you won't see that lipid content within a pheo. Um, and then final thing about this collision tumor um, controversy. Um, so even though the urologists and endocrinologists said they never use this term, my pathologist said that they use it. So they use a collision tumor for two tumors arising in the same location um, and like in the same gland. So for example, an adenoma and a pheo, although this is extremely rare, um, and they use a different term called tumor to tumor metastasis when metastasis goes to um, a different lesion. So a lung cancer met to an adenoma, they would call a tumor to tumor metastasis. So that was just um, one interesting thing. Do you guys have any comments? Uh, Cookie says, stump is the new radiographics review article. I have a case of a FIO that has lipid. Yes, so FIO can, um, have, can occasionally have lipids, but it's much more common for adenoma and adrenal cortical carcinoma to have them. And when we say lipid, it's not true fat and it's not actually a true lipid. It's a steroid that, that is like a lipid because it's not water soluble. Um, so this was a patient who was a young patient who was having um, anemia and GI bleeding. So gist. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. So this was a large gist in the stomach um, and not really that much of a differential. Um, it's a large mass. It doesn't look like a gastric cancer. It's round. Um, it has air and fluid within it. And so this is usually when the, um, the surface of the gist erodes and has a fistulous communication with the surface. It does not mean that it's more aggressive and it does not even necessarily mean that it's necrotic. Um, but the thing that I wanted to also bring up in this case was that, this will share. Um, this patient, uh, this was their, their path report. So it said that this was a gist, and then they also said it, it was stained positive for DOG1 and CD117, which is very common. And then they said, based on the location, um, the size of 6.7, mitotic rate of two, this uh, tumor has a low rate risk of progressive disease. And so I just wanted to review that um, you can use these nomograms to tell you what the, the risk of, of a particular tumor is for gist tumors. So for example, here is a Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, calculator. And so you can put in like the size of your tumor. So say I put in like 13 centimeters, the site. So the stomach is the best, uh, has the best prognosis. 
Um, after that, I believe the rectum and then colon and then small intestine. So if I, if I put a 13 centimeter tumor in the stomach with a low mitotic index, less than five, and I calculate this, um, they would end up having a, a, a probability of recurrence-free survival of 88%. Um, on the other hand, if I put that same uh, score in for the small intestine with a high mitotic index, they would have about a 2% uh, probability of recurrence-free survival. So the importance of this is that you can actually, they put this in their path reports, and this can help you have your pretest probability when you're looking at follow-up exams to see if this is a very high-risk tumor or like some a low-risk tumor that has a low rate of recurrence. So um, you know, even though it's pre, it was fairly big, seven centimeters, this just tumor had about a 98% risk of disease-free um, survival. And the chat says. Bernoulli, Torricelli Bernoulli sign. Gitanjali, can you tell us what that is? So that's classically seen with just tumors when they ulcerate. So it's one of the upper GI signs where you see an ulceration in the, like a submucosal mass. So that's known as the sign. I thought that's what you were asking when you showed that ulceration with just. Oh, cool. Now I learned something new. Um, awesome. Okay. And then I just have one more case. Um, it's this patient who uh, was asymptomatic, no history, no history of malignancy, and they presented with um, this lesion in their liver. So you can see it's fairly T2 bright, has a little fluid level in it, a little T2 dark area. Um, this was the pre-contrast. Arterial phase, you can see there's kind of like rim enhancement as well as this kind of more nodular enhancement. Venous phase, you can see there's like a septum with Ferrandi enhancement on it. And this is the delayed phase. So what do you guys think about this? This was a male patient. They had this strange lesion in the liver. It looks cystic. It, it seems to have enhancement in it. Any thoughts? This was a mystery case for us. We do now have a diagnosis. What's the age of the patient? Uh, it's a 50 year old male. And there was no history of liver disease. Um, I can show you diffusion. So it looks like almost like a rind of diffusion. So we thought this was very weird. We said, maybe this is some kind of weird abscess, but the enhancement is bothering us. Um, the patient was completely asymptomatic. Um, so they came for follow-up and basically this lesion did not change uh, three months later. So we thought, you know, a mucinocystic neoplasm would be strange in a male with this appearance, but maybe that's what it could be. Any other thoughts? An adenoma that bled? I don't know, just guessing. <laughs> Good thought. I mean, anything was open here. Anyway, they ended up uh, biopsying this. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to say something. So can we see the gallbladder? Yep. OK. Yeah. So anyway, we ended up biopsying this, and this turned out to be a neuroendocrine tumor. So well, I guess my take home point is neuroendocrine tumors basically can look like anything. And, um, you know, we know, we've talked in this conference a lot about these cystic versions of the neuroendocrine tumor in the pancreas, but um, you can also get cystic neuroendocrine in the liver. Um, so just, this is a nice reminder about that. We searched the pancreas elsewhere. We couldn't find a primary. Um, so they're going to be going for, you know, dotate and other workup, but um, this was kind of an interesting, surprising diagnosis. I, I always say, if you don't know what it is, put differential ne neuroendocrine. <laughs> That's a good thought. So add it to the lymphoma sarcoid. And, uh, it's, it's like a lymphoma now, you know, especially yeah. with bizarre uh, tumors. Uh, if yeah. you can 
humor. Um, I know we were kind of kicking ourselves afterwards. Like, oh my gosh, why didn't I think of that? Because like, if that was in the pancreas, I would have definitely brought it up, you know? So, okay, that's it for me, Nelly. Um, okay, uh, let me, you know, I don't have any slides prepared. So um, as before, I'm going to ask um, for people to contribute their um, known knowledge so that we can learn from the collective group. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, yeah. no? Okay, yeah. great. Um, so this um, is just a bizarro case. Um, I, um, I, I mean, I, I, I would never put this in a differential diagnosis, but it's, you know, you see it once, you'll remember it. I, so there's a T2, uh, it's a T2 hyperintense lesion in the prostate. Um, let me pull up the diffusion. Here's the diffusion, it restricts. Hypointense right there. Um, and it was enhancing right there. Any thoughts? Patient had a biopsy and I, I can't see the text message, so you'll have to just. No one's texting in. It's that oh, cheeky okay. bright thing next to the per peripheral zone you're saying? Yeah, no. this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And there's, uh, there, this thing. Nobody, I don't think anyone would have ever guessed. It turned out to be a schwannoma. Um, just so interesting case. Um, I guess like Kelly, Nelly in retrospect, are we saying like that's the neurovascular bundle area? So maybe we'd think of a nerve thing. Yeah. I mean, actually, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if it's coming from that. I mean, it makes sense I mean, given its pathology. Um, uh, so yeah, it could be because it, I mean, it is in the area of the neurovascular bundle. Uh, let me go back to the MR. Yeah. Right there. Right. Posterior lateral. So maybe it's extra prosthetic. Um, what do you think about this? Sorry, I think someone texted something in, but I can't read the text, so I'm just gonna- I'll tell that. you, Nelly, we were um, we were just talking about your last case still, and we said that oh. um, Ross says it doesn't restrict ADC very much for a peripheral zone tumor that big. And then I said um, also that T2 brightness was nice for a nerve tumor in retrospect. Oh, okay, awesome. Yes, to all of that. Um, okay, this one, um, this case, uh, what do you guys think? DDX. It looks had, to me like a necrotic mass that is more of a ball than a bean. Um, yeah, I don't know my upper or a bean like, more than a ball, you mean? Like, well, it's, it's kind of like form. in between ball and bean to me. Like it looks, part of it looks like a ball, but then it is conforming to the renal cortex. So to me, it's like a differential, like RCFC versus a bad urethelial. Yeah, I mean, I, I presented a case, um, similar to this before and you know so this turned out to be a um t uh, urethelial uh, carcinoma um so just keep that in a differential diagnosis when you have an infiltrative you know lesion that's hypo enhancing relative to the cortex i'm sort of i mean to me it looks more like a bean than a ball um but that has to be in the differential because we treat these differently from um, rcc which are treated just classically with partial or nephrectomy, whereas we do a, a complete nephrectomy on patients with um, urethelial, um, which this turned out to be. Nelly, um, in retrospect, yeah. I now agree more bean ver versus ball. I have a question. Do you think it's extending into one of the renal veins? Like I saw something going centrally right there, like that thickened thing. Do you see? Um, yeah, let me pull up the axials. Hold on a second. And lower esophageal. Like here, you mean? Yeah, I was wondering. Looks like, a, looks like that's the artery. Yeah. Um, there's a ve the vein is here. Let me see if we can trace the vein. There's an excretory phase, so it's not really super good, great, but. Mm. It just looks like there's like a triangular beak. The only reason I bring that up is that yeah. um, I had a case similar to this where it was extending into the vein. And so then we were wondering, you know, can, um, 
that does that mean it's more likely RCC? Because RCC loves to invade the veins versus urothelial does not. Mm-hmm. But turns out they both can. So if it, oh, it's good you to still know. think it's a, yeah, if you think it's urothelial, um, it could still, even if it's invading the vein, it could still be that. So you still need to biopsy it because it'll change mm-hmm. management, like you were saying. Oh, good to know. I didn't know about that UCCs can invade the veins too. Uh, let me pull to this next case. And I'm just going to pause for a second. Um, make sure. Okay. Yeah, it's more rare, but it can happen. So if it, if you're really leaning towards RCC and it's invading the vein, that can help you. But if you're leaning towards TCC, it can't exclude it. Okay. Um, okay. So this next case, um, this is a patient who, um, another renal case. Let me see. Oh, sorry. This is post-op. Ah, this is still post-op. Um, here, pre-op MR, that's the T2. Uh, here's the post. Uh, diffusion. Solid areas um, are restricting. Okay, what do you guys think? It's definitely coming from the kidney, Nelly. It's not adrenal. Yeah. Right? Let me give you the coronal. Um, so it's replacing the kidney. Can you show a T2 again? Yes. It's not really invading the IVC, which is interesting. So I'm thinking this could either be like a sarcomatoid RCC or I don't think it's a urothelial. Yeah, so this um, came back as a undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, um, which is, so, I mean, in the kidney, we often, of course, the most common is RCC, clear cell, um, but this just looks so ugly, right? Like it's, um, I mean, I mean, clear cells can look really ugly, especially when they're really big, but this one was um, invading the liver. Um, uh, I th- there was also a, like invasion to the posterior, the posterior structure, so I think the psoas. Um, so this is, um, yeah, it was a pleomorphic sarcoma. So keep that in, in the differential when, when you see some like an ugly mass like this, um, in the, especially in the kidney and retroperitoneum. You want to pop any other um, teaching points, Arthi, or others? And sometimes or sarcomas uh, arise from the capsule um, rather than the parenchyma. Be good yeah, to no, have some no, we'll pathology on the chest CT report. Um, those are my cases. I'm, I'll save the others for later. Any if if anyone else wants to present. Anyone else have cases? Otherwise, Nelly, you can keep going. Nobody else told me that they had cases. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Um, so let me let me go back and share my um, screen. Um, okay. Uh, let me see. So where? So. I have them pulled up, and I mean, some of them. I think they're just okay. Okay, let's do this one. Um, so this case came in with abdominal pain. Um, and I think this is something that like, it's kind of um, helpful to keep in your differential diagnosis for small bowel um, thickening um, that I don't always think about. Let me show you the axials. With ACE inhibitor-induced angioedema. Yeah. Oh my God. Brilliant. Um, yeah. This patient was on lisinopril, and you know this is um, Cookie has awesome teaching points for this. So maybe I'll um, turn the mic over to her in terms of to teach us because uh, she's 
So one of the things as good as the beautiful mural stratification that this uh, example shows when you see the mucosal hyperemia, but the key is looking at the submucosa being very low. Um, so it kind of would exclude in your mind lymphoproliferative or proliferative infiltrating lesions because it's a- oh, This is a heart transplant patient, by the way. This is why we're bringing up lymphoproliferative. Uh, yes, edema. Um, the the drug is usually lisinopril uh, and it can go from two to nine years. It doesn't have to be, it's not time related. Sometimes people will uh, state that they had a recent increase in their dose, but not necessarily. So it's, it's not time dependent. It loves the jejunum uh, and it really mimics uh, uh, small vessel ischemia. So it looks like it's you know, uh, small vessel disease. So, I mean, I could show you a case like this that looks like lupus, right? So small vessel, you know, ischemia. So it loves the jejunum, usually has some mesenteric edema, mesenteric fluid, and ascites. Those are the three things that I put together with it. Um, and it's unfortunate that there is an average, somebody did a paper on the average number of ER visits uh, with ACE inhibitor injuries, 3.2 or something. So patients come in three times with these acute episodes of um, pain and angioedema. And, you know, we just say something like jejunitis or enteritis or bad food poisoning. And they go home, they come back a couple months later and it really is up to the radiologist to pick, uh, pick this up. Nice. Do you know what's causing it, Cookie? Like, um, and and can it eventually lead to ischemia or like any kind of perforation or anything more severe? Yeah, it, it, they they looked at it like it's some uh, issue with bradykinin release uh, with it, um, and uh, it's not really mis it, you know ischemia except that it causes the venous congestion and outflow. So I mean, it has the mural uh, you know ischemic look but it's not ischemia by pathophys. It's actually, when they go in the OR, some people call them ischemia and they go in the OR and it looks pretty, at least from the surgeon's eyes. So it's at the mucosal level, just like lupus patients do. Cool, great case. Um, Millie, you had some arrows on stuff that I wasn't sure what you were, point, that we were pointing at. Were there like transition points or like? Just... Um, I'm gonna move on to this ca next case because I don't remember what the arrows were. Okay, and then um, after this one, Teresa has one too. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, I can have her share, uh, present. Um, just, just do this one quickly and then we'll do Teresa. All right, um, all right. so this was a patient. So we got a non-con CT and we found uh, these you know, two masses. Um, so we said it was worrisome. So we got a CT, um, a CTU. And uh, this is the contrast enhanced. So there's the first one. And then there's the second one. What do you guys think about this? Let me show you the non-con again. Um, it's, you know, this th thing in the back is hyperdense. Uh, and then this thing is, was enhancing. Patient uh, had a nephrectomy, so we have path. Any thoughts? You want to give me this chronal? Okay, based on our last two case conferences, I'm gonna guess an oncocytoma and a MEST. <laughs> oh my goodness, because of this case conference. Okay, um, um, and um, any other guesses? An oncocytoma and a MEST. Like, looks which, one, which one is onco and which one is MEST? Well, I was thinking the large one could be oncocytoma or chromophobus, I think Cookie was started saying, like, cause it's so large, but it's fairly homogeneous and it hasn't metastasized or spread into the vein. It's dense the, on non-con. This one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then um, the other one I thought messed because it's solid and cystic and kind of mildly herniating into the pelvis. Um, messed and so combo. Um, so this was, I mean, this is just a, the, the, the big one is, um, turned out to be a classic, uh, clear cell, um, RCC. Uh, and then the sec, the small, the, this one was an RCC clear cell. Uh, and I think the cystic stuff is probably just area of necrosis. Um, even though, yeah, I see what you're saying. It herniates into the, um, renal pelvis, renal sinus. And this one turned out to be a papillary. So hypo-enhancing is hyperdense on non-con. 
This conference is making me worse. <laughs> you know, it's just a really great case. It's just, a, you know. Okay. That, that you know, it stumped the, um, it stumped us too. So. Oh, okay, great. Teresa, do you want to go? Yes, I'll try to make it quick. Um, oops. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Can any, oh, you can hear me. Okay. So this is a patient CT from several years ago. Just uh, attention to the gallbladder. Okay, and then patient comes in with right upper quadrant pain. Uh, Okay, so first, just what's going on with the gallbladder in general. I mean, in the posterior, there's like an like a defect or, you know, just a disruption in the mucosa. Yeah, and there's like, it's thickening. Um, do you have the diffusion? Um, yeah, it looked like there were multiple areas where the wall is- Yeah, so it's definitely- Yeah. Perforation at the top. Right, so it, it looks like acute you know, cholecystitis with multifocal areas of perforation. Um, Stones in the distal CBD. Um, you know, uh, I think this is just some artifact. I mean, there perhaps is a stone distally, uh, but that's not what we think is the cause of the um, acute cholecystitis and perforation. Do you have the coronal T2s? Yeah. That's just always fat. So I want to draw your attention to the orientation of the gallbladder. Oh, like it's stores. So if you look. Right, so if you look here, it's more transversely oriented. Um, if we compare it to the prior, uh, it was more you know, vertically oriented. And then also if you look at the infundibulum, follow the cystic duct, uh, you can see it you know, here medially in a normal position. And then if we look at the uh, current study, the infundibulum is actually way over here. So the whole thing's been rotated and you can follow the cystic duct, it's elongated. Sorry, I'm not here. It's very elongated, it's been twisted around. We don't see the, you know, twisting that well on this, um, but you can see that the rotation is now, you know, completely flipped from where it was. So we thought this was consistent with torsion. Here you can kind of see the, let's see. So here's the cystic duct, you know, it's elongated, it's stretched, and then we actually lose it, you know, for a one centimeter gap. So we're thinking this is probably where it's twisted and then it, you know, extends out laterally over here. So unfortunately this patient is just way too sick to um, operate on. And so they ended up putting in a cholecystostomy tube. Any questions, Very comments? Cool. <laughs> No, people are saying nice case, cool. I wonder if that little part where it's, yeah, where it's missing is like where it's actually twisted. That's what we were thinking. Maybe that's where it's twisted. That's crazy. So yeah, and then these are all the, you know, multifocal perforations. There's kind of the biggest one. So I think we're out of time. Thank you, Teresa, that was great. And we will work on the screen share for next time. Thanks everyone. Thanks all.